many times the masters have spoken. And many times we here on this planet have heard, yet we have not listened. The voice of the master has said, having ears they hear not. And therefore all of us, recognizing this fact, should realize that there are a multitude, a babel of voices in the world. Some of these voices make us happy. Some of these voices make us sad. Many moods and conditions of the mind and feeling of man are created because of our listening to the various voices that are in the world or the voices of the night as well as the day that speak in the mind. But the voice of the living God is the still, small voice that beyond all these voices, out of the whirlwind, the lightning, and the thunder, proclaims to us a realization of who and what we really are. And when we understand who and what we really are, the monad becomes the neophyte, the student, the follower of God as dear children. The neophyte opens the inner ear. The neophyte listens and hears and obeys the mandates of heaven because there is no way other than that that leads to eternal life and eternal freedom, freedom from all distress, Yet, it is not a promise that today, this second, we will be delivered from it, but rather that we will be placed upon the highway of life, the road that leads to eternal life. It is up to each and every one of us to secure our own high calling. We must make our calling and election sure, each of us and all mankind regardless of his forte of knowledge or his forte of experience, what he has done, what he knows, he must understand, he must open his heart unto the deity that speaks that men often do not listen to. He has said that he observes the fall even of the sparrow. Can any of you then doubt the goodness and mercy of the Lord which will follow all of us all the days of our life if we will only open our ears. Open the ears of the soul, the ears of the heart, and perceive the jewel diadem that is the universe. The you and I verse. Do you see? You and I verse, V-E-R-S-E. The sonnet of life, the song of life that sung through the angels over Bethlehem's plain, proclaiming the great message that is eternally alive. Behold, I am alive forevermore, God has said. And so the beautiful soul that is within you, beneath the package, the wrapping, of the mind and the experiences and the limitations that we have imposed, the beautiful soul, like a fresh new scroll, awaits the impressions of divinity that speaks. All these other voices confuse the mind. They point in divers directions, but they do not tell us the one magnificent statement that Jesus made plain. I am the way, he said. And when I say that, I am sure that some of you will say, oh, I've heard that before. Yes, you have. But you have not heard it before as it is, most of you. Because I am is the flame that spake unto Moses and said, take off thy shoes from thy feet, for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Right where you stand now is holy ground. I am the way. 
You yourself are the way. But not in your outer personality in its embryonic state of becoming, but in the native identity of your soul. This came forth fresh from the hand of God. It is not manufactured in our factories. It is not created in the world by man. It was made by God. Have you ever looked at the little stamp on something that says made in Japan or made in the USA? Well, there's a stamp on you if you turn yourself upside down or one way or the other, and it says, made in heaven. Now, people don't believe that sometimes because the sully, the soot of the desert of the world, has covered them with an overlay, and they cannot see the forest for the trees. They can't see the reality of themselves. So I want to talk for a moment tonight upon the great shrines of the masters and the talismans that are placed in the heart of the earth in various places. You are all souls. And you have an inner radioactivity inside of yourself. When this activity is misused and the consciousness falls not from heaven alone, but even from the level of the earth and falls into those states that are carnal horror, whenever it falls that way, don't you know that the substance that oozes out of your pores, the substance that oozes out of your consciousness, permeates the whole universe, in a sense, with an odor that is not sanctity. There is the mark of Cain, then, upon mankind, when his deeds are the deeds of Cain. And so, many among mankind today are sick and in prison purely because they have erred in understanding who and what they are. And they don't understand that just as we leave our fingerprints upon objects that we handle, so individuals who touch us or individuals whom we touch are also recipients of the energy pattern, the vibrational pattern that we ourselves put out the frequency that we manifest. Well then, don't you see, if we were in a company of saints, that all of the beautiful vibrations of those saints would rub off on us, and we would momentarily be imbued with their sense of righteousness and attunement. But if you're in a company of demons, watch out. Because in this world today, there are places that are not heavenly. And there are places that are heavenly. When you go in to these places that are not heavenly, keep your tube of light around you diligently. You don't have to have any fear about it. But keep that beautiful white tube of light that comes from your God presence around you. It is a gift of God intended to be the protection of your soul. Now, most people today buy insurance. This is your insurance policy. But it is only in effect when it's paid up. And it's only paid up when you've called it forth. You must call it forth. You must ask God to place that tube of light around you. You must ask him to seal the rents. See that there is no possibility of any arrow or sling of outrageous fortune to penetrate that level of consciousness. And when you do, you will be the recipient of greater grace because the grace has already gone forth. It is not something that is not going forth. It is going forth at all times. And the grace of God is sufficient for every human being. It is rich with the gifts of heaven and they are for you. Heaven is like a divine counting house. It is filled with the golden coins of spiritual treasure, the golden bars of universal love. They are all there and they are tangible and real. We are not talking about something that is not a commodity. But we are talking about a commodity that is a commodity of heaven. 
that is released to people today that money cannot buy, that is a treasure of the soul. And when you and I get that treasure in our heart and consciousness, we become animated by it. And the animation not only starts out first in consciousness, but also floods forth all over the world and through our life wherever we go. Everything is expansive, radioactive. It is illumination. You are that. Oh yes, you are destined to become that ultimately. But you do not have to wait until you are dead. Why, what a ridiculous thing it is. For people to imagine that they must first physically die. It is not physical death that we need. It is the recognition of dying unto those things that have never satisfied our soul's longing, that have never given us release and happiness. We have everything and yet we feel that we have nothing. And this is solely because we have not recognized the great powers of heaven that are latent within every man, the monadic expression. So returning then to the idea that I started out with, the idea of the talismans of God, just as man leaves his little puny talismans everywhere until he learns how to control his energy and let his mind be one with God, so the masters leave their talismans on the earth. When we stood not long ago in Jerusalem and we entered what today is the Mosque of the Ascension, a Mohammedan gesture in a Christian shrine, we saw the rock from which Christ ascended and we placed our hands there on that spot where Jesus Christ left his talisman of the ascension. And what did he leave it for? He left it as an example of the finality of each life when it has become victorious. Thousands of people all over the world, millions, have hung Christ upon the cross and keep him there. We do not repudiate the sacrifices he made, nor do we repudiate the sacrifices those who have followed him have made. For many that followed him, even among the apostles, were crucified both right side up and upside down. They were tortured, they were sawn asunder, they were burned at the stake, they were fed to the lions. In those days, there was a fervor that permeated the world because of what is real. This has been and is today, now for too many years, the lost word. It is the lost chord. It is something that mankind have literally forgotten, save the few in every generation. Yet it is the gift of the many and should be the gift of all. And therefore the talisman that Jesus Christ placed on Bethany's hill in Jerusalem, is the way that all should go, the way of the ascension. But the way of the ascension is not a matter of snapping one's fingers and then pushing a button and watching as one automatically rises into the air in the victory of the ascension. No, it starts every day, every morning when you get up. It starts because you begin to raise your vibrational pattern. Because when God pipes to you, you dance to his tune. If the world pipes to you and you dance to the world's tune, what happens then is that you stay right where you are or you may fall in vibration, either one, depending on what you're listening to. But if you listen to the heavenly tunes, to the spiritual melody, your consciousness will be raised. And with the raising of that consciousness, you will suddenly perceive the scroll of the universe. The scroll of the universe is an unfolding one. And you will perceive this scroll of your perfection. And you will look at that scroll and you will see the way made plain to you to victoriously triumph over every circumstance of every day. Do you know something? We all have troubles. Whoever are here upon this planet have troubles. We cannot promise, nor does God promise to anyone, that just overnight all your troubles will cease. But I have seen them minimized, 
rather than maximize. And they could be so much worse, couldn't they? You can look around you and see people who are afflicted, and then you see others who are more afflicted, and it is a matter of degree. And you can say to yourself, there but for the grace of God go I, and it could be so. So what is important is that we pursue the Master as he walks, the Christ universal image, that we understand that all things were made by him, and nothing that was made was made without him, and we understand that the him is the Christic emanation, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, that every joint heir as well as the heir would be quite naturally designed to fit into that pattern. And so we do not ascend just one second because we snap our fingers or because we push a button and it's automated like an elevator. Instead, we started out every day with the dawn of that day. If we have erred, we don't worry about it to the point of despair. We say, dear Lord, I have sinned today. I have erred in this way or that way. And we are genuinely sorry for whatever error we may have made. And we try to correct it. We try to improve our sweetness toward people. We try to improve our love toward God. We try to improve ourselves, but know that of ourselves we can do nothing. But we must also know that with the Christ we can do everything. And what is the Christ? The Christ is the light of the world. Whose world? God's world, you say. Well, we know this is God's world, but there is much darkness in this world. And it is often the darkness of world despair, of El Schmerz, that makes many, many people feel that there is little opportunity here, when in reality there is. We have just as much opportunity today as man ever had. And I sometimes think that we have more because man has learned to raise his vibrations to the point where people that are coming into physical embodiment now are often able to attain a greater mental grasp of life than years ago when slower methodologies pervaded our world when people did not understand how to grasp cosmic principles. Why, they couldn't even understand Billy Sunday. They couldn't understand and still don't understand Billy Graham, and I'm not sure that he understands himself. <laughs> oh, yes, I think this epitaph, if you want to call it that, could be applied to all of us. But the point is, we must understand that God knows what he's doing, even if we don't. And when we understand that, we will understand the most important part of the plan, and it is not that man should constantly be crucified by his experiences, but rather that he should be ascendant in those experiences. The most important part of the life of Jesus Christ was his ascension. Yet mankind have not stressed it. They have stressed the healings and the raisings of the dead. But I ask you, did not every person that he healed also die later? I ask you, did not those that he raised from the dead also die later? So what is the important phase of man's existence? It is immortal life. And the conferment of immortality upon mankind was the greatest gift. Not just physical healing, but the healing of mind and soul, the whole being of man. And the gift of the ascension was the final victory of the Christ. Here we find the assimilation of the body of Christ. His light body ascended into the cloud and it received him out of their sight. And the light body dissolved in the cloud. And the sacred cosmic Eucharist was born. What is the cosmic Eucharist? He said, the things that I do shall ye do because I go unto my Father. He went unto his Father, and the cloud received him out of their sight. He was dispersed throughout the universe, as each and every one of us is destined to be. We are not destined of necessity to just take our physical form and transmute it, and then disappear, but rather to appear everywhere, and still be capable 
at our will of appearing in a physical form if we wish to do so, in other words. We want you to understand then that what most people bring as the fruit of their lives to the close thereof is not worthy in most cases of being immortalized. So what we are talking about is our consciousness being elevated by the masters, by Christ, by God, until a time comes when perfection appears in our consciousness and first in our mind and heart. We see it. It is the product of God. It was his original gift to us. He gave it to us for Christmas a long, long time ago. Do you understand what I mean? He gave it to us a long time ago. We just simply have not unwrapped it. We have not used it if we have unwrapped it, or we have used a little of it and left the rest sit there to deteriorate, but it won't deteriorate. There it is. It's waiting for you. It's waiting for all of us. It's the Christ Mass. And the Christ Mass, the body of Christ, like Melchizedek of old, dissolved behind the cloud and pervaded and permeated the entire universe. And today, you not only can draw in to your lungs the same atoms of air that Jesus Christ himself breathed into his physical lungs or his spiritual lungs, but you are able also to take eat this is my body which was broken for you. To understand the spiritual experience that's behind this. The experience that will lead you as it has led the apostles, as it has led the holy men of old, as it has led those great men that came to Abraham with a staff to take their staff out when food was offered to them, to touch that food with that staff and watch as the electronic electrode burst forth in the universe with the chin power of the sacred fire of the positive and the negative and how the flames rose up and they were received back to the universal because that is the only way that these exalted spiritual beings could possibly eat anymore. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. He didn't have to partake of life by taking the physical bread anymore. He could if he wished. He could manifest and he proved it. He said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as ye see me have. So, is come and dine. He prepared the food upon the shore and they came and they took it. And he was a tangible being. In all my experience with the masters, I have found them to be tangible beings. They don't always bring their substance into manifestation to everyone. And I understand why. Because there is a karmic responsibility for it. Do you think a master manifests without some effort? Does anything happen? Does the wind blow without some effort? What makes the waters ripple and stirs them or whips them up into a frenzy? There is an effort in everything that takes place in nature as well as in ourselves. And the summoning of cosmic power is an ultimate transformation to those that understand how to use it. Understanding how to use it will help you. It will help everyone. We can, if we wish, be mediocre. We can live content to take our favorite TV magazines, love stories, anything we want to. We can create human romances. We can sit here and gormandize ourselves on food. We can enjoy life to its fullness. And I'll give you 20 years about. That's about the time that most people really have much zest for it. You know they say life begins at 40. Well, quite frankly, I believe that most people do not even understand anything of life to speak of until they're 20. So that gives them 20 years to 40. Well, they say it begins then. But for most people that I have seen in the world, it deteriorates from that point on. It isn't very long. And the nurses have told me this in the hospitals. They've talked to me, and I wasn't a patient, but I've talked to the nurses, and they said, a man's vibration falls way down. They said some of the people at the age of 40 and 45, why these people are 70 in their body and vibration. I'm not going to tell you who, but there is a certain man in this town that was taken to the hospital 
And the nurse said his vibration at 49 was 70. And she handled all kinds of men day after day after day. And that is how he vibrated and how he manifested. So everybody has to understand that not only is youth eternal in the mind, but it's eternal in the soul. You can't deteriorate the soul. It will never deteriorate if you will nourish the soul with divine food, the manna that came down from heaven. If you will understand what this really means to take, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It is not a cannibalistic orgy or rite. Instead, it is the assimilation of the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. In other words, of the Christ flesh. It is the building within of the structuring of divine identity, divine ideation, which is the ideation of God. We don't have to be ashamed to manifest it. It does not require silver and gold to gild it. Jesus said, Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so we should understand that the inner clothing, the spiritual clothing that is within, is that which enables us to follow the Master's mandate, I am the way. Now, do you suppose any of you, take the great Master Serapis Bey, who carried the flame from Atlantis to Egypt and planted it there long ago. Take Serapis Bey. Do you suppose that his existence, his activities, his conduct have any meaning to you other than the power of an example or the power to perhaps intercede for you if you call to him, unless you learn to vibrate and to be the kind of a man that he was. Do you see what I'm getting at here? In other words, I am the way, the Master says. The I am in you the God part of you, the flame that appeared to Moses in the burning bush, the pillar of fire, and the cloud of witness. This is the way, but it's in you. You say, well, if it's there, I don't know about it. Some people might say that. But whether you know about it or not, that flame is there, and it's a dynamo. It's the most powerful force in the universe because it is the divine gift implanted in man. Well, some people say, it's in others, but it's not in me. No, it's in you. It's in everybody. It's a matter of your utilization of it, of your recognition that it's there. If you will understand that it's there and proceed to act accordingly, not to take heaven by storm or say, Lord, if I don't get everything today, I don't want it. In your patience, possess your souls. Start a program with God. Ask him to give you your ultimate victory for the day. Don't ask him for the final victory of the ascension right today unless you're ready to receive it. I know of one woman one time, and you might find this interesting. She heard about the masters and her karmic load and all of that. So she got down on her knees and she said, Lord, she said, please dump all my karma on me. Everything. She said, I want to get it finished. I want it to be over with. She got it. She got it. It all came dumping down. And after a while, she saw that she was facing a hopper. And there was an awful lot of it in the hopper. So she said, Lord, she said, stop it. (laughs) She asked him to push down the slide. Because it's all governed. It's governed in mercy. I can proclaim to you that I know for a certainty that people that were destined to die at 50 received a dispensation to live till they were 70. And people who were destined to die at 70 received one to live to 100. I know for a fact that people get dispensations. And this is not a destruction of the power of miracles or of non-miracles either. It's simply the fact that God can do what he wants to do if you want a covenant with him. You cannot bargain with God. But you can prove something by your life. This doesn't mean that you get so good. 
that everything in the world has changed because you're so good. Jesus Christ himself said something, and I think this is one of the saddest things in the world, that our modern Christianity today does not know what he said even though they read it. He said, why callest thou me good? That's often forgotten. People insist that he and he alone is the only one that can forgive sin. That he and he alone can do all these miracles for each individual as though we did not have anything to do for ourselves at all. And this is the greatest lie and the greatest fear that Jesus ever had, if he ever had any fear. And that was that people would worship him. Put him on a, a pillar. Stick him up as an icon on the wall. Have him hanging on the cross. Sorrowful. And then not do a blasted thing that he said. They never follow him. They just ask him to save them. The realities of life are that you have a holy Christ self. You have a, a mediator. And that mediator is a very tangible part of yourself. It came forth from God with your soul. With your mighty I am presence, the flame of God, and the causal body. It exists inside of you. And through it comes the power of the paraclete, of the Holy Spirit. This crystal cord descends from the heart of your presence and anchors within your heart where the golden bowl is not broken as long as you live. You know that song? When the silver cord is loosened and the golden bowl is broken, I will rise, in other words. You don't have to wait till then. Oh, you'll rise all right. Whatever is inside of you of God will go up like a balloon. That is, unless, of course, you're earthbound. And there's some people that get pretty earthbound. And they need dynamite sometimes to pry them loose. I don't mean against their will. For heaven's sakes, they're praying their heart out. There they sit sometimes by their gravestone, sometimes in their coffin, sometimes in their old home, or even in their rooms. And they can't move, they're bound. And there they sit, bound, unable to move because they never have had an experience of moving outside the physical body. And they don't know how to move. It's like learning to swim in air. It's very difficult if you've never done it. The locomotion of the spiritual body is not handled as you do with your limbs. Actually, you handle it very much by desire, of course. But if you've never used desire, it's like trying to fly without understanding the principle of jet propulsion or of ionization, or of the engines that fly our rockets. You don't understand the principle of it. And so you don't know how to use it. People may be God in design, but they are nothing in function. And this is the greatest problem there is in the world today, is everyone's promising them liberty, and they themselves are the servants of corruption. That's what the Master said. People promise them liberty, and they themselves that promise it are the servants of corruption. It is absolutely unnecessary for any person to be subject to these carnal laws if he doesn't want to be. I'll admit, if you have only your last breath at this present second, to get this information, I would hazard a guess that you probably wouldn't get very far. And that is why it is all important that people begin to work and to understand that they work with God. Unless we work with God, nothing is going to happen. The people that have sat around and waited for Jesus to do it for them are the ones that are not following the Master's footsteps at all. I believe that he has tried to communicate with them endless times. But having ears, they hear not. Having eyes, they see not. They do not perceive with their senses. They do not magnetize and they do not understand. There is a gift to be sought. There is a gift to be gained. In fact, there are gifts. And they are endless gifts because they are the removal of the barriers of limitation from the consciousness and the acceptance of the divine potential, the explosive power, the radioactive power, the electronic power that is in your mind and heart right now. I don't think any of us, if we just desired to use it and didn't have any instruction in how to use it, 
could successfully do so. But there is one thing you can do. You can say, Father, I know there are institutions that must be brought into my life, changes that must be instituted in me. So I ask you, Father, to help me. And then you say to yourself, well, what are these problems that I have? Enumerate them if you want to, but don't dwell on them. If you have a drinking problem, don't sit there and say, Lord, I'm a, a permanent drunkard, because he won't even believe you. <laughs> if you have a problem with women, don't turn around and say, I'm just no good, I'm a slave to women or to men. Don't say that. Don't tell God all these things. He already knows what you are through the karmic board and through the karmic record. He's not concerned with hearing how sinful or how error-prone you are, how weak you are, how scared you are of the universe or of life. So you turn around and you beat everything in order to make lots of noise so you don't really hear yourself thinking. Don't worry about things like that. And stop pursuing fruitless goals. Instead, just simply recognize that there's a plan. And the motivation of that plan is in yourself. But it has to be opened up. Now, most people don't know that they have a spiritual body. They don't understand that the chakras, the remnant of the chakra, for example, of the pineal gland located right in the middle of your forehead from which the legend of the cyclops comes. Jesus talked about it by saying, if thine eye be single, thy whole body is full of light. The perceptions of the pineal gland are very great. When people understand how to open up the third eye, great things can be accomplished. But you go ahead and take a little marijuana, or you take some of these drugs like LSD, and you may open up the spiritual eye so that it looks about like this, you know, or this. Instead of opening up, as God would do it, in, a, in the right way, you get a warped matrice. You get a warped conception. And you, all you vibrate with is the astral. You may see pretty things like beads and shiny little glitters here and there. Or you may perceive horror beyond your wildest dreams. All of these things listed as a bad or a good trip occur to many of our young people. But these are not the things of the kingdom of heaven. This is what is known as taking the kingdom of heaven by storm. And you never get very far. Have a good one and you'll have a bad one ultimately. It's almost inevitable. So what you have to understand is that there is a proscribed methodology that heaven employs whereby these glands may be opened safely and spiritually by the hand of God, not by the hand of man or by dangerous drugs. So what we have to understand is the rapport that can be created between ourselves and the universe, which rapport will absolutely bring to us the thunder of the dawn of the Christ consciousness. And with it, we can look into every man's eyes and see where he is and what he is. We can look into our own heart and see what is there. And if we can see, we can create the therapy to remove our problem. But don't forget that all we can do for one another is probably help one another. But kindness is important. It's important that we be kind and that we have understanding. It's important that we be different. We shouldn't be like everybody else on this earth, especially with the state of the world that exists today. Instead of that, we should be an individual. What does that mean? Why, it means individed. You have the whole universe, and the universe is individed, or the bread, the whole loaf of the universe and the universal consciousness, the leaven of God, is broken for you. This means that you have dispensed to yourself a portion of the consciousness of God. Many years ago, Somerset Maugham, in his writing, the book called The Razor's Edge, portrays the great high master Lama as saying to the young neophyte, in answer to his question as to what is God, he says, here is the ocean. He plunges his finger down into a pool of water, a bowl of water, and he holds up one jeweled, sparkling drop. And he tells the young man, he said, this is your soul, a part of the universal ocean, shining with all of its splendor, 
but limited in the amount of that ocean, but not in the quality there. We should understand then that this is how we are. There is no one else in the universe in any field of endeavor whatsoever that can excel you in soul consciousness or the talents that may be developed by a determined soul consciousness that would knock at the door of the universe and ask that door to open so that that individual may pour forth to life the gifts that are the gifts of God to all mankind. This means that you become the open door that no man can shut. When Jesus Christ affirmed it and said, I am the open door which no man can shut, he did not intend to create the illusion that his personality, the personality of the man Jesus was the open door, but rather that your own individual I am presence was the open door, which means God, and if you don't believe that, Go to the very last and final eschatological argumentation of the scriptures and read that final argument where it says, and when every knee has bowed to Christ, it says, then will Christ bow also to the Father that God may be all in all. So what's wrong with God? But today we have people all over the earth that call themselves in name Christian. They embrace the name of Christ but do not understand that it was not just to accept that he lived and existed and forgave sins and did good works, that mankind was supposed to understand, but rather to understand that in themselves there was implanted by the Father from the beginning the very power of the cornerstone of the temple, that each man had the cosmic cube within himself to understand form that spirit is intended to control the outer form, the form matrix being absolutely dominated by the will and the motive and the endeavor and the endeavor power to do what that individual wanted to do. So-called black magicians of the world, those involved in the sorceries of the world, they get involved in mass control. But that isn't important. They even get involved in mass hypnosis as well as individual auto-suggestion. But that is not what is important. What is important is the recognition that they are Christed beings. If they understood that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, if they understood that one statement, and I want to say it again, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, this means that there is nothing in the universe, no matter how good it is, that God wants to withhold from anybody, whether it's spiritual, or whether it's material. So how ridiculous for people to turn around and follow the legend of Faust. You understand what I mean, the Mephistolian legend? Mephistolus, you know? The idea of selling their soul in order to gain some particular accomplishment? This is unnecessary, because God already wants to give it to you. All you have to do is qualify through accepting his gifts and graces through the natural process. Which among you today, if I gave you a beautiful rose, a lovely pink rose, and placed it in your hand, and on that rose there'd be a dewdrop, and on that dewdrop you would see glistening light, and freshness is in the rose. It's immortal freshness, and you're holding it in your hands. Now, which of you would be able to actually take that rose and make it open if it's only a bud? Most of you would sit there and look at it and wait for it to open, and your patience possess your souls. Some people couldn't wait, and they'd begin to tear the petals one by one from the rose. And where would they go? They'd fall to the ground, and by and by you'd hold just the stem. With the barrenness of the abomination of desolation staring you in the face. Whatever treasure you have today, don't make the mistake of tearing that treasure from yourself or trying to prematurely Realize it. One of the greatest and wisest things that anyone can do is not have the idea that by doing some particular specific act, such as walking to an altar and getting down and praying, or having some minister lay his hand on you, or do some particular thing that seems to be an act of grace, receive absolute, immediate perfection. Why, you got that perfection from God the minute you got life but you haven't followed its precepts. So the important thing to do 
is to understand that which I talked about in the first place. The idea of living each day as a chain of days that lead to your ascension, your ultimate goal. It is absolutely wrong for people to think not that the Holy Spirit cannot perform miracles for man, miracles of understanding. God can take his hand and place it across your brow right now. And all the cobwebs of human thought and darkness can suddenly pass away. Your understanding can be opened. God can open the scriptures to you as you have never realized before. But not only that, the hidden scriptures that are not necessarily recorded with pen and ink but are recorded in spiritual akasha. These can be opened too by the Spirit of God. Everything can be opened by the Spirit of God. But then after your consciousness is opened, what are you supposed to do with it? You are supposed to use that knowledge. Otherwise it passes from the screen of the mind because it is not you. So I tonight have desired very much to give you a little glimpse of these spiritual things. Because... Through this glimpse, you may, having tasted of the spoon of heaven's grace or potential in yourself, have come to realize that it's worthwhile and you may want a feast. Well, the feast is there waiting, but do not expect that it is healthy that you devour it all at one sitting. It cannot be done and should not be done. Otherwise, we would have spiritual indigestion. We need to take step by step a forward movement in our lives until after a while we are changed, as the scriptures say, from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We move in progressive increments to spiritual attainment. After all, Rome was not built in a day. It took nine months for us physically to manifest before the period of gestation was fulfilled. Therefore, it takes a certain time spiritually. It isn't that God is limited or his hand stayed. It is that we ourselves must understand the need to temper the wind to the shorn lamb. When man first steps toward God, he is often naked in his consciousness because he sees with awe the tremendous vastness of life. But let him understand that all of that is his heritage. To each of us is given the treasures of immortality. May God give us the wisdom to be able to use it. Tonight, as usual, we will have this question and answer period. We reserve the rights, as always, to refuse to answer questions that we feel would not be in the common interest or for some reason, either known or unknown, we feel we shouldn't answer or couldn't answer, either one. However, we have done very little of that, as history will prove. We've answered most of the questions as best we're able. So we're ready now for the first question. You name the subject, we'll do our best to deal with it. Well, Dr. Balma, go ahead with your question. I wanted to ask you about the, the uh, comment you made last week about momentum. And, uh, oh, during the sermon on momentums, yes. Uh, something about your momentum cry when you die. Uh, do your momentum pass on in the next embodiment? Do you have any momentums that follow you? Of course, of course, whatever. There's a statement in the scripture that goes like this. It refers to the passing of man from uh, one life to another. And it says, let him that is holy be holy still. And let him that is filthy be filthy still. So death does not change anything. The only kind of death that changes things is when we die to the wrong things and awaken to the right things. But just physical death does not change anything except we move from one room into another. And quite naturally our momentums, that is the established momentums of our life, will remain in their full power just as we had them in life before. And they come into embodiment with us when we re-embody. However, they need to be developed. I will not deny that they are potentials rather than full-blown manifestations. We see this in children. A child musician, for example, that in the past life was a genius, a musical genius, comes into embodiment at the age of one or two, may manifest 
tendencies that are far greater than people even of 7, 8, 9, and 10, or even 20 manifest. But uh, when the child puts this all to work and harnesses it, why then you see this genius at work. But it is from the past. Does that answer your question? Fine. Another question, please. We might have some good, exciting questions here tonight. Let's stimulate our minds and spirits and see what we can come up with. Try to stay away from fantasy. Let's uh, deal with things that are practical and helpful to people. Who has a question? Now you got all the answers? Yes. I wanted to ask you to say, when you die, don't you burn off an awful lot of karma? Burn off karma when you die by the act of death? Well, this would depend only on the process of dying. If a person had a very serious illness, for example, and experienced a great deal of pain, they could expiate a great deal of karma in the passing, but the act of death itself would do nothing. Death is a natural process just as life is. We all die every night and we go to sleep. If you know what I mean, I mean, the minute we lose consciousness, we die to this world. We are resurrected the next morning. The only difference is that people that die, I mean, uh, wake, are resurrected, they, they fall asleep in one body and are resurrected in another. So death itself changes nothing, but the acts that precede it may. Yes? Uh, what's your feeling on the, uh, the degree of uh, the art of self-defense that a man should uh, attain in order to be able to ward off the evil forces when it becomes necessary to uh, defend yourself physically? <laughs> and two, you know, light is not being. Well, I have not actually s encountered a great deal of this physical self-defense. Uh, I mean, some of us are trained in karate, and, for example, but we've, we never use it because we don't have to as a rule. In most cases, we, uh, we use uh, spiritual defenses. I, uh, I had to uh, resort to the spiritual defenses the other night, and, uh, and it worked, but I got to thinking that there might be a time in the future <laughs> when it wouldn't. Well, I think you're quite right. I was uh, out in Nebraska many years ago at a military function. When it was before I was in the summit, so please don't hold this against me. But uh, this was some kind of a wild dance, which I wasn't participating in, but I was just there with some friends as a as a spectator, you might say, when a, a fight erupted between the Army and the Marine Corps. <laughs> and uh, everybody was hitting everybody else, right and left. They were knocking their teeth out. It was, a, it was the most awful battle you ever saw. Uh, it was unbelievable and bloody on top of it. And I was there, and I walked around as nonchalantly as I could. In fact, I didn't smoke, but if I would have had a pipe, that's about the way I was walking around, you know, just looking. <laughs> You know, and nothing happened. I never got hit. It was the funniest thing. Well, I, I, had, uh, I, I think that you had mentioned one time when I thought you had that you were very well versed in your self defense. But, uh, you know, I believe that you probably never had to use it. But I, have I haven't had to use it, thank God, and I'll knock on my head. I hope I never do. Uh, I have it primarily uh, not mastered, but. Uh, worked on just so that in case women or children in my presence would, would ever be set upon by a maniac and, and no other defense would work. I mean, a man hates to be completely, uh, you know, without the ability of self-defense, you know. But I personally don't believe that in most cases you will have to use it. The story is told of, uh, I think it was Cardinal Mincenti, and as you probably realize, regardless of what church we're talking about, there's always the same God involved. And uh, I find that some of the cardinals and some of the spiritual leaders are uh, in the higher echelons are really quite spiritual people. Not in all cases, but in some cases. I understand that Cardinal Mincendi was extremely uh, versatile and very spiritual. And I understand that, uh, I believe it was the Nazis came, some of the high-ranking Nazi elite guard, the SS guard, into his apartment. And he... Uh, 
came in and he had such presence and command, spiritual presence and spiritual command, that he literally just wiped them out with one glance, you know. They just absolutely couldn't face him. It, it, it reminded me of uh, the happening in the life of Jesus Christ uh, when he was in the uh, garden there uh, near the brook of Kidron, I think it was, and they came to take him, you know. You, you remember the scene. I, I hope you do anyway, you know, where Christ was out there and they came with swords and staves, you know. How many of you have ever read this passage I'm going to tell you about? Well, it says this, this is what it says. It says, and they came out and then the master said, Whom seek ye? And uh, they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And then he looked at them and he said, I am he. And as soon as he said that, it says they went backward and they all fell down. <laughs> you read it, it's right there. So there is a lot of spiritual power that can help if you really need it. it we could explore this at great length, but I hope that's all right. Yeah. Another question? air is filled with hushed expectancy. <laughs> well, the question that he has asked is, could I say something about healing by psychics or what he calls true healing? Well, the question itself is more or less decisive because uh, you have indicated in the question some element of doubt as to whether healing by psychics is necessarily valid. And uh, I realize that many people may have this idea, but however, I want to say that it's not my intent to malign anyone's work. I'll have to come to this point, that there are people that ought not to be healed, first of all. One time Mother Mary told me this. She said that there are people that you cannot heal either because of a lack of faith or because their karma is such that it will not permit you to heal them. Sometimes you can mitigate a condition but not necessarily erase it completely because a certain amount of karma is valuable for some people in order that soul lessons may be learned. So what you have to do, of course, is uh, determine first of all, as to whether or not you're able to heal them and whether they have the faith. And of course, you can't heal anybody and I can't heal anybody. Only God can do the healing, actually. Now, the psychic is in the same category as a true spiritual man. The psychic probably does not understand the dangers of psychicism. I mean, the, the dangers that are inherent within people who contact the astral plane or the lower astral plane or they get involved with these things, you see. This is a danger, an ever-present danger, because uh, the people that you contact there are so disoriented in most cases. And uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very dangerous area for me to talk about because someone might misunderstand me and think I had it in for anybody. I don't have it in for anybody. You know what I mean. But uh, at the same time, while I have many friends that are spiritualists, I am not a spiritualist, you have to understand. And psychics and spiritualists are almost synonymous. And spiritualistic healing is very similar to that. I'd like to separate that from the metaphysical type of healing that Mary Baker Eddy engaged in, which was a different activity entirely, even though Phineas Quimby may have been involved with her at one time. I mean, she did try to, to heal through the Christ mind. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And I think that true healing is through the Christ mind rather than through any form of psychicism itself, which is dangerous. It's dangerous to the people who do it, and uh, sometimes it results in people getting healed, and then afterward it comes back on them, you know, in a lot of cases. In some cases it doesn't, but there's a lot of energy involved in it. And uh, sometimes the healers reach a point where they're so depleted of energy themselves that they get sick. And that's the danger, too. You know. I don't know if I've done you much good on this. It's, it, it's a tricky question. It's kind of a loaded question. Not on your part. I didn't feel you were insincere, but it's kind of loaded in the sense that uh, I don't like to deal with questions that may seem to impugn any part of life. 
especially in the general audience, because I, I never want to hurt anybody. I realize people are doing the best they can. You know what I'm talking about. And they all have different views, and there's an ongoingness in life. But I mean, uh, like many of us started out in one church, for example, and then uh, as life went on, why we, we gained greater wisdom. And some of our ideas that we had at one time, we've outgrown. So we all have to recognize the potential for spiritual growth in our life. But this doesn't mean that everything that we started out with was bad. You know, a lot of people start out with a church that probably has concepts that you wouldn't really want to embrace today. But still, it doesn't mean it was bad. It was probably good for you at the time. You know, it was the best thing you had. Yes. I have a question about drugs. He said that you mentioned several times in yes. the discussion. And usually you mention drugs uh, that the young people take, like hallucinogens and marijuana, LSD, and all of that. Yes. Are there other drugs that people take, uh, maybe not this group, but people usually in the outside world take? Like aspirins? Aspirin, aspirin, any kind of drug, but also it have a similar effect on the community. Definitely. No, although I think these are primarily the targets of, of people today because of the effects that have appeared in society. I mean, very bad effects have appeared in society among some of the children even in pre, not preschool, thank God, but I mean uh, pre-high school. Sometimes even in the junior high levels we've found kids taking drugs and they really shouldn't. And then we find uh, that the uh, government has been feeding drugs to some uh, types of personalities in an organized program over in Nebraska and elsewhere, I'm sure, where they've uh, fed drugs to them that retard their, uh, uh, what do they call it, hyper, hyperactive qualities. And, and in other words, they try to keep them down or they sort of depress them or something. I think that the whole drug situation is one that should be avoided as far as people go. You know, people should try to steer clear of drugs of all kinds. I know many, many highly spiritual people who absolutely avoid drugs. Some people won't even take an aspirin. On very rare occasions, I'll admit that I've even taken an aspirin. If you get a bad enough headache sometimes, or you get a bump, I mean sometimes you just feel that you have to have something. And I think sometimes it's better to uh, do it. Now like in my case, my consciousness and my body is so pure that in most cases, if I take an aspirin, it's like taking a shot of heroin. You know what I mean? It just about knocks me out. So I get tremendous uh, benefits from such a thing if I needed those benefits, but I rarely need them, you understand. But I wouldn't hesitate to take a mild thing like an aspirin, whereas I certainly wouldn't recommend morphine unless it's a case of, and the doctors will give you morphine sometimes. I remember getting very high one time <laughs> on a, uh, a man uh, taking radioactive burns off of one of my fingers. I had radioactive burns and he had to do surgery to take them off. I still have one right here where he, he cut them off. And uh, they used uh, some form of injection and he just injected and injected and injected about 25 times all around my hand. And I never felt anything until he hit the bone. And when he hit the bone, believe me, I just about hit the ceiling. So I, I don't believe in drugs, but of course, uh, I think in hospital work, to be honest with you, in, in surgery, it's almost essential. Uh, I mean, you can't... In fact, uh, an interesting thing about surgery, I, I would like to tell you, I'll volunteer, uh, I'll make a question and then provide an answer. Uh, several years ago, in surgical procedures, they did not actually give morphine before the surgery, but afterwards. And they lost a lot of people in shock. And so then now they have found out that it is essential that they give morphine before the surgery. Now I wonder if, if many of you people realize why this is so. The reason is that the morphine has a tendency to dull the sensibilities of the memory body. The memory body that has all the records of the cells in it and that carries on the automatic functions, like your heartbeat. You never have to think about your heart. Your heart just keeps beating, you see. You hope it does. And if it doesn't, you won't worry about it. But the point is your heart keeps beating. So uh, when you give somebody a 
shot of morphine if you're a doctor, I mean, then the memory body never feels the cutting. You see, when you put somebody under ether, and there's no morphine in them at all, but they're under ether, the memory body inside of the person feels the knife. And it feels it all. And so then it gets terrified that because of this searing, biting pain, that it's going to die, and it throws the body into a state of shock automatically. Do you see what I mean? But if you dull it with the morphine, then it doesn't feel it. So this proves that there is a consciousness inside of people that is always awake, even when you're outside of you, the conscious mind is asleep. And that, that shows that the benefits that are conveyed then through this surgical process are proper. Before, the blood pressure used to go down, they'd blanch, tur turn white, and they'd die from shock. Even if the operation was a success, the patient died, you know. But now with the morphine, why, uh, the, the body elemental does not go into a state of shock and does not lead the physical body into a state of shock, and therefore, uh, when it wears off, by that time, things are stabilized, and the pain is not so great, you see. That's a marvelous thing when you stop and think about it, the, the systems of the body, because some people do require surgery. I mean, there are people that, uh, well, little kids swallow scissors and objects, you know, and you have to sometimes perform surgery. I mean, uh, personally, I believe in divine healing as much as possible, but you still have to give the doctors credit, recognize the various forms of the healing arts for what they are. Well, I think we don't have any more time now, and uh, I regret that uh, we don't have any more time, but I do thank you for coming, and perhaps we'll get started a little earlier the next time. I hope this was helpful to some of you, if not all of you.